Um, today, as you can see, um, our colloquium speaker is Mona. And the fun part about giving these introductions normally is that we tell you some random story about how there are long lifelong friends or how we've known them from something or else. But in this unique opportunity, I don't have to ask for a bio because I can just go to Wikipedia <laughs> and, and read a bio. So it's like we've, we've sort of like upgraded um, from what does the speaker want to what does the entire internet know about them. Um, and so, and, and we were just chatting about the, the fun of basically starting off in one major and switching, and so Mona has a series of, of degrees that led to where she is now, um, starting over in Egyptology and then making way through computational linguistics and computer science um, to, to here. Um, where she, after graduating, was a professor at GW for a while, um, and then moved to FAIR, and I don't know how many people know this, and was working on what is believed to be very relevant to what we're going to hear about, which is being responsible in tech, uh, being responsible as NLP people. What did that look like, um, being, being a major role in that? Before we were um, able to steal her to come be the director at LPI. And I mean <coughs> steal in a fun kind of way because friends of mine at Meta sent me texts after her appointment here was announced, being like, you literally stole her from <laughs> us. Um, and, we're, and I was basically just grinning um, at the fact that we had done so. Um, the fun thing about Wikipedia is also that anybody can edit it. So what she doesn't know is that the fact that she's now at LPI in her Wikipedia is, is my fault. Oh, really? <laughs> I was like, who did that? <laughs> the second that it was, we were told it was allowed to go live, I, I turned to Bob, who's our resident Wikipedia expert, and I was basically like, can I just like, can I just change it? And he's like, yeah, like you can do whatever you want. I mean, the, the moderators will probably catch it, so you should have evidence. Um, and so I just went in and I quickly started editing her Wikipedia page, editing LPI's Wikipedia page to make this all very broadly official. And so it's very fun to have gone from what felt like a mischievous act of telling <laughs> the internet via Wikipedia to being to able to actually hear her give a talk about what um, her vision is for our field writ large. And so without further ado, thank you. give you Mona Diaz. Oh. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction. And actually, a Wikipedia page indicates also age. So it <laughs> says <laughs> so I'm really, really old. So <laughs> um, well, thanks a lot for everybody who's shown up today. And hopefully, uh, we'll have a good couple of hours together. So what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about responsible uh, AI and responsible NLP, but actually also in practical terms. So um, as you all know, I actually, uh, before coming here, I was uh, at Meta for quite some time working on responsible AI. I was the lead research scientist there for, uh, across Meta, looking at the intersection of operationalization of responsible AI te tenets in technologies. So that's part of the inspiration that led to this talk. So before I start, I'd like to start from a place of gratitude. Everything that you see here today is really the result of work that I had done in collaboration with fantastic students, um, collaborators, postdocs, research scientists, mentors. So I just want to make sure that this is acknowledged up front. And I'm really horrible with slides and horrible with uh, graphics. So that's going to be evident as we go through this presentation. So basic scientific terminology, I'd like to get this out of the way. So science and its methodology. So as all of you know, science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of structure, behavior of physical and natural world through observation experimentation. The scientific method entails objective observation, experimentation or, or observation as benchmarks for testing hypotheses, induction through reasoning, uh, repeatability, critical analysis, and verification and testing. So these are the steps that need to be you know, grounded in our scientific enterprise. Some basics around technology. So as you all know, technology is the application of this scientific knowledge to reach practical goals in specifiable and reproducible ways. But as you all know, also society uh, can be affected by technological advancements. And some of them could be beneficial, some of them could be harmful. Um, I also wanted to lay down some uh, foundational terminology around NLP versus co computational linguistics. So both of these um, terms have been used interchangeably in our field. And they're really concerned with the interactions between computers and human language. In particular, how we program computers to process and analyze large amounts of natural language data. But also, you can think about it as like a goal. One of the goals is for a computer capable of understanding the contents of documents, including contextual nuances of the language within them. 
there was an interesting um, sort of like, uh, I don't want to say uh, debacle, but really like a debate that was going on uh, in the field around the turn of the decade, around the 2009, 2010 uh, time, when people started asking like, why do we have these different namings? Why do we have these different um, uh, terms indicating our field? So this is stolen from Jason Eisner. So basically what computational linguistics or CL is about is about developing computational methods to answer scientific questions of linguistics. While NLP is really like the art or science of solving engineering problems which need, that need to be analyzed or generate natural language text. So you can think about this from the perspective of a metric of success. It's not whether we designed in NLP, whether we designed the better you know, uh, scientific theory or proved that languages X and Y are historically related, but rather the metric is whether we're good at solutions on the engineering problem level. I think of machine translation. So we judge it as whether translations are fluent and accurate. It doesn't say anything about the theory of mind of how translations actually happen in our brains. So really, when you come to think about it, CL is more concerned about scientific generalizations, while, con while NLP could be you know, relegated a little bit more towards the technological components of this, technological utility. So all of us acknowledge that there have been huge advances in natural language processing. So we're living through a golden age. We devise practical and usable by lay people NLP technology. Think of assistants like Siri or Alexa or MT, machine translation, ASR, OCR, la large language models like ChatGPT, and so on. So from my perspective, I think about this, and this actually happens. At a Thanksgiving dinner, I come from a very, very diverse um, family where I have my uh, in-laws are Tunisian. We have friends who are Japanese and Cantonese speaking and Hindi speaking. And I speak Egyptian Arabic. I'm native speaker of an Egyptian Arabic because I'm an Egyptian. And my brother's in-laws are actually German. So what we end up doing is using Google Translate, but also my little nephew, poor thing. He's always translating across the board. This is an actual picture of him. Um, and then there are new technologies and uses emerging in large language-based uh, large language -based generative AI. So could LLMs have generated my talk? Yes, actually, they gave me some very good, interesting, um, you know, I gave it just a title and it gave me this narr narrative. Uh, but also could have generated my slides. Actually, given uh, the title, they just gave me a lovely outline and some, um, it was a nice starting point. And this is some of the slides that they generated for me, which I think were really nice. Actually, the graphics are much nicer than what I came up with, as you can see here. Uh, but NLP, as in the LLMs, is making, a f is making like mainstream media. So it's making the first page of The Guardian, or New York Times. And actually, even my dentist asked me this question uh, some time ago, if, I should, if he should trust LLMs to give him a solution and, and a treatment protocol for myself. And I was like, no, please don't do that. You know? <laughs> I would rather not have you rely on ChatGPT for that. Um, but basically, we've seen a huge proliferation of generative AI across the board, all over the place. I don't need to tell this, this crowd about this. But as you know, large language models have made a huge impact. They're allowing for the development of sophisticated AI applications, revolutionizing the way we interact with the world around us and unlocking our precedented scale of services and systems. But they also have some technological, uh, some uh, impacts on society. So potential for increased automations to the potential for creative expression, which is lovely. Potential to create a better, more equitable society. But privacy and societal challenges are still abound. So what is the state of the union for large language models? There is a fierce competitive scaling race, as you all know, like from Llama, Bard, Claude, to ChatGPT, uh, and OpenAI technologies in general. Uh, but what's interesting about this, I don't know if m people here know about that, but in fact, net it took Netflix around 10 years to reach 100 million users. ChatGPT reached this number in two months. So it's like exponentially uh, pervasive. And there's an impact on environment, so the scale of the required compute and it's very cost prohibitive. Actually, here at, at CMU, for example, we've been discussing the potential of actually having our own machines to train some of these models. And the infrastructure required, infrastructure required for this is gigantic. And it also shows a stark reflection of the haves versus the have-nots. So where is academia in this, in this, um, in this discussion? And let alone non-Western, non-West uh, you know, Coast type uh, enterprises investing in this technology. So with great power comes great responsibility. So basically with these huge advances and truly disruptive technology changing the landscape for AI and natural language processing, changing the narrative, the research and the product landscape, but it's extremely accessible, fluent and intuitive, which garners trust almost immediately. 
So some of the problems, as we know, are large language models are overconfident, they hallucinate a lot, they have a lot of biases, and we have this instinctive anthropomor anthropomorphization that happens, which is kind of scary. So we're at this inflection point. So there are some open questions. If we are going to have guardrails around these technologies, where and where, where and how and what kind of uh, guardrails should be in there? How can we ensure the veracity of these technologies? Um, whose ethical systems and whose ethical values are going to be implemented in these techn technological uh, breakthroughs? And what about cultural awareness? So this is something that people don't talk about a lot in our field, but we're starting to go beyond even language to culture. So how can we make sure that the cultures are actually represented? And a lot of people think since we scrape the web, then the web is kind of sufficient. It's actually not the case. The web is not a full good reflection of the world uh, populations. So, and what about multimodal foundational models? Uh, can, do they help mitigate or exacerbate some of these problems? So these are interesting questions. So a lot of research that needs to go into that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that we need to also pay kudos to our community at large but also we, all, we owe a whole lot of gratitude to, for this golden age that we're living through is around the technologies that enable us. So think about software engineering, hardware systems, systems engineering, machine learning, but also sciences that empower us like sociolinguistics, pragmatic social sciences, core machine learning, statistics, and domains that leverage us. So we're penetrating lots of domains like the medical field, the legal field, medicine, uh, politics, and so on. So what's the NLP the future? With the mainstreaming of natural language processing, we're at this inflection point in our field. Uh, could we turn this into a diamond era for natural language processing? Hopefully this crowd here would be part partaking in that. But how do we also ensure the longevity of the field at, at large? And I believe in sustainability, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. So this talk is about this vision for the future of NLP. So just to give you a very high level view of the status of our field from the 1950s, that you think about that as sort of like the inception point for our field. Um, we have been going up in terms of performance, and, uh, but is there still room for improvement? Hopefully yes. But what tasks, what technologies need the investment? Are we asking the same or different questions that were asked in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on? Or are we changing the type of questions that are being asked? What about the scale in terms of compute and data? It's actually been going up as well. But that also leads to some efficiency um, trade-offs. So efficiency has been going down. Accessibility has been going down. So you're getting more rich and rich. So you get this bimodal distribution in a sense. Um, and transparency has been going down. Um, but also, there is a lot of um, you know, thinking around explicit linguistic uh, representations. So in fact, it's been declining as we get bigger and bigger in terms of our, um, in terms of our representations in, the, in, in, in our models and our technologies. Uh, so before we used to have linguistic rules like morphology, phonology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Then we moved to feature engineering and then feature representation and representation learning in the current, model, in the current models that we're building. So basically we're seeing across the board, if you think about this historically on a horizontal level, we're seeing that NLP used to be equal to CL, like given the definitions that I gave you earlier, and now we're seeing a serious bifurcation. And in fact, CL is almost getting to be away from this picture altogether. Um, basically, I feel like in this technological rush, we should not be losing sight of the underlying data that we have and not losing the CL component. I think that's part of our spirit as an NLP technology. So just to give you a sidebar lessons from CL from my perspective, so uh, in Egyptian Arabic, people cannot hear the P sound. They cannot tell the difference between a P and a B. As the younger me, I used to think that people were lazy and they're not able to put enough effort to learn how to say the P or the B. So it was really a prejudiced and biased um, you know, outlook on, on, this, on this until I studied linguistics. Uh, we have the same thing with Japanese L and R. So for, especially for L2, L2, uh, L2 meaning second language learners of this, uh, of English. So it sounds choppy to them. So basically we have this problem for Egyptian Arabic, we have this problem for, for Japanese speakers. So I mean, and you can come, come across multiple, uh, multiple second language learners from different backgrounds who have an impact on, on how they hear things and how they um, uh, interact with, with language as a second language. So but understanding this phonological generalization could lead to better accented ASR could lead to a better accented speech generation, better L2 educational systems. So there are benefits to understanding this from a CL perspective, from a, you know, like a core linguistics perspective. 
And crucially, it was really humbling knowledge from my side. Basically, basically I hope it made me less judgmental um, and more empathetic, at least around languages. But also, this insight could have been dri driven or derived from data, especially given large scale today, the large scale of data that we have today. So hence, informed phonology. So that could have been a pattern discovery that could have been powered by this, the sheer size of the data that we have. So it could be a symbiotic relationship. It's not necessarily only in one direction. So back to the state of, the, uh, of NLP today, we have these um, huge systems that are out there, huge technological breakthroughs, but they also have some problems with them. So a lot of opaqueness, a lot of unpredictability, hallucinations, privacy violations, harmful output bias, disinformation, misinformation, inefficiencies, and so on. And these are symptoms of uncontrolled systems. So what does that actually mean? So control is being able to control the outcome, the performance, and the predicted reliable, reliably. And with the size, the sheer size of these systems, the controllability of them is, is, is actually a big challenge. And this is an area that a lot of people in our field work on. So how can we actually gain more control over the systems that we build and the technologies that we deploy? So um, when we used to have those very uh, small systems, small scale ones that had explicit knowledge representations and so on, they tended to be more controllable because you know exactly what goes in there what, what, and you can predict exactly the life cycle of the data, the life cycle of the, of the models, of the algorithms. But now, unfortunately, we have this sort of like almost black box and this is a problem. So this red curve shows you that this is going down. So what is the North Star for our NLP technologies come 2030? Hopefully, even before that, given the scale at which we're operating and the speed at which we're operating, Hopefully the performance keeps going up, the compute and data scales keep going down because we want to have less footprint, but also control should go up. But how do we go about doing that? In order to control, we need to infuse guardrails, and which come from understanding the underlying phenomena, so basically understanding the linguistic structures that we have, understanding our data, I think is critical to the enterprise. And we've seen that learning by osmosis, I mean, absolute self-supervised learning, which is actually the kind of technology or modeling that powers a lot of these technologies that we have today, have shown in their colors, right? But we also need some prescriptive knowledge infused. So identifying this appropriate prescriptive knowledge and how much of it is an area of research, but also relies on understanding the phenomena, and nuances, and context. So, I mean, I've been in this field now for almost 23 years or so, and the more I get exposed to students and more ex exposed to people working around me, I see less and less of an interest in understanding the underlying data. It's like, let's just dump it in and see what comes. And hopefully that sticking against the wall and coming back is not necessarily going to be the, the spirit of our enterprise going forward. But I really, really encourage people to look at their data to understand the phenomena because you can get a lot of really interesting insights that could actually have modeling and algorithmic um, impacts afterwards. But essentially, the other aspect of this is leading to explainable and transparent models and systems, which is something that's very desirable, especially once you start going to domains that require a lot of accountability. So things like the medical domain, the legal domain, you cannot just get away with giving them a result and, uh, <coughs> and um, a performance number. You actually need to tell them why you came up with that decision or why you chose that, that route. So the proposal is to consider natural language processing technology as safety critical systems. So think about medical devi devices and airplanes with more guardrails and regulations. Of course, not as harsh as they, they, these systems are, but, you know, but closer to that as opposed to where we are today, where we have a lot of fuzziness. And critical to critical systems and central to critical systems is robust evaluation. So think about red teaming, for example, root cause analysis and reliable mitigations. So these are very critical to our field. And this would get a lot of, by definition, it would force us to have more conversations with people, our colleagues in software engineering, in t testing and validation, and so on. So what is the future of NLP? It's basically controlled NLP, meaning that's safe, accountable, predictable, transparent, private, secure, and reliable and efficient. But also the future of NLP needs to be usable and has to have utility as a central aspect of, its, of the whole enterprise. Therefore, NLP should be trusted and sustainable. So the rest of this talk is going to go around this. So controlled NLP, being safe, accountable, predictable, transparent, private, secure, reliable, efficient, these are all tenets that we've heard before in responsible AI. 
So in responsible AI, it, it's concerned with accountability and governance. It's concerned with robustness and reliability, privacy and security, fairness and inclusion, efficiency, transparency, explainability, and ethical design. So these are the tenets. But can we make this practical? So here is my proposal. It's a responsible AI framework, what I call RAFE, Dimensions. And it's basically informed by many published responsible AI manifestos that came out of Meta, Google, MSR, Partnerships on AI, etc. So what does it comprise? These are some of the dimensions. Responsible innovation, which addresses the why. Why we produce AI technology, addressing societal impact, human value alignment, responsibly. So think about ethical design. Responsible systems, it addresses the what. What AI technology? What covering research, engineering, products? So think about the privacy, safety, fairness, robustness, reliability, explainability, interpretability aspects of the technology you're building. Responsible research conduct, which is something that we lost track of actually as an enterprise, which is essentially this, what we used to study as part of the scientific method of like how we conduct our research. So it's essentially about how we conduct our research, development, and deployment, Ta taking things like accountability, reproducibility, efficiency, traceability, and openness into consideration. And finally, diversity and inclusion, which addresses the who. Who the target users are, who the developers are, who the researchers are. So think about, for example, in the context of a company, team makeup, safe meetings, accessibility, and so on. A lot of these dimensions overlap, and they sort of seep into each other as well. So what is a RAFE mindset? So I believe this is the basis of what I call responsible thinking. And RAFE, if we are to consider AI technologies as critical systems, then we need to produce RAFE-compliant technology. So I'm borrowing the terminology from critical systems here into this, into this domain. So RAFE applies to both AI performed responsibly by us and AI applied and deployed responsibly for the user. But also RAFE needs to be inherent in our defining, devising, development, dissemination stages of the technology proactively and strategically. So thinking responsibly is not an end stage. So this is something that a lot of people get mistaken. They think, okay, if I do this, I just do it once and I'm done. No, it should be an ongoing process. So it's constantly worked on proactively. It's a muscle that needs to be strengthened and get strengthened with practice. So what is the current practice that we have in our field? Um, many people in our community work on aspects of responsible AI, but mostly desperately. And for the majority, responsible AI considerations are typically an afterthought or optional, only heeded by those who work directly in that space. So if you don't go to FATE, uh, the, the conference, most probably you just do this as sort of like a side effect kind of uh, thing. And it's mostly confined to the ethical and limitations paper sections, if present at all, um, in, our, in our work. So why RAFE for NLP or AI? NLP AI technologies and artifacts have huge societal impact. I think I've already established that. So think about responsible systems, responsible research conduct. NLP technologies are in need of a generalizable North Star with more scientific integrity. And it ensures value alignment, human value alignment, which is a responsible innovation uh, consideration. But also it emphasizes human centricity through ethical design, therefore ensuring utility and practicality of our technologies. So think about diversity and inclusion but also builds trust entailing higher user adoption. So a lot of technological breakthroughs with enormous potential for benefiting society at large face barriers, especially when there's a lack of public trust or confidence. Um, so what is the motivation for adopting RAFE for NLP AI? I think a framework from my perspective serves as a, creating, as a guide for creating a space and a trajectory for people to, to sort of like look toward. But also, a defined framework serves the community as a forcing function. You think about it like, if you think proactively about responsible AI tenets and RAFE dimensions, if we explicitly address them in our design, then you know, we come up with research questions and hypotheses that are already past that muster, so to speak. So what is the benefit of a framework? As I said, if you have random brush strokes, no matter how skillful the various painters, it doesn't lead to the Mona Lisa. But if you are coordinated, I think the Mona Lisa could potentially evolve. So is this Mona Lisa attainable? Let's take a look. So what is the objective? RAFE from inception to dissemination, but also RAFE at scale. So can we do this at scale? So RAFE for NLP AI artifacts checklist. So we can think about this as a checklist that we need to sign. So we have responsible innovation. Is the purpose of my work benevolent? Can we address considerations and limitations? So look at the why. Uh, is my tool model system uh, reliable, safe, generalizable, and so on? That addresses the what. 
uh, do, I fully have, do I have a full traceability, accountability, and compliance and reproducibility around my technology? Addresses the how. And did I address all possible subgroups as team members, for example, or target users, for instance? That addresses the who. So this is something that we operationalize within the context of Meta, which is essentially, um, it started off with an RRC guideline, the Responsible Research Conduct Guideline. So at project conception and inception, we looked at the intended outcomes, who will use this research, how can we design our project, and so on. So this is responsible innovation. During R&D, research and development, we looked at data collection methods, model training methods, evaluation methods. So this addressed the research um, uh, systems uh, component, uh, the responsible research conduct component, uh, and the DNI component. And then at dissemination, we looked at the papers and the talks and the mo models and the codes and the data cards and the um, different types of cards we, we, uh, we basically generated and looked at the levels of transparency, how, much, how transparent were we in, in our dissemination. So there are some questions to ponder in this, in this situation. Is RAFE expensive? RAFE is typically considered a friction point, so people t tend to tell you, oh, those people come again, here they come and talk about responsible AI, how boring, and they start yawning. Um, and it's like, okay, no, we're not that boring. Actually, we are saying something very good. It actually has monetary value, in fact. So it pays off eventually. So, and if you, especially if you do this, yeah. I'm sorry, can you ask questions? Uh, as you wish, I don't know what this is. Yeah, I can take questions, yeah. Here? Yeah. So um, why are these apps probably very like broadly imposed across the use? It's probably not always possible because we can have like full accountability, reproducibility, and be like diverse and inclusive of the mm -hmm. So how do we resolve efforts which at least take a step towards that direction, but also lay out the regulation in a way that is more So it's about being transparent. So obviously, there's always a trade-off, and this is actually what I was gonna talk about next. It's around the trade-offs. But th there's always gonna be a trade-off because there's also time to market. There's also the value of what you, you know, like how much guard rates can you put in there. So this is definitely taking into consideration, but putting your best effort towards that. So it's, that's why it's like a North Star in a sense. Nothing's gonna be completely comprehensively fantastic. You're always gonna have some kind of a trade-off. But you need to make it as a sort of like an educated, trade-off, so to speak, as opposed to just throwing it out there and seeing how it, it ends up, um, you know, landing. Yeah. But good question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so that was going to be my next point, actually, <laughs> the potential trade-offs. So, essentially, that's exactly the point. If, like, you know, you need to consider these different trade-offs and figure out, you know, what, what, is it, what is it actually, which cost can I bear, right? So, for example, there's some technologies that went out there without being, paying attention to the responsible AI tenants that we need to pull out from the market right away within a couple of days, which is really, really bad. Like what happened, for example, with Microsoft in 2018, uh, the conversational AI agent that went out. Because they didn't, it's not that they did not do this intentionally, but they did not pay attention to the potential implications. So that got to be a very, very expensive experience. Right. Um, so what does it also mean for, so this is, it sounds a little bit geared towards industry, but in fact, academia also has a role to play here. So what kind of things that we need to do in terms of our own research, in terms of the models that we produce, the technology that we produce, even the talent that gets generated from, from our enterprises here, how does that get taken into consideration and in how we build the new talent uh, going forward? We need full control to be able to calibrate this level. Of, so basically, if you have all aspects of your system under control, then you'll be able to figure out the right kind of trade-offs to make at different junctures of your technological development. So there are ethical considerations that might be at odds with profit, obviously, but having more RAFE voices can be internalized and the paradigm could, be tip, could tip the balance. Um, can it create tiers among NLP practitioners? Uh, hopefully not, especially if DNI is taken very seriously into consideration. So just as a reminder, the future of NLP is to be trusted and sustainable. And could RAFE be, um, could lead us to that future? That's gonna be the next part of my talk. So a responsible NLP uh, via trusted NLP is achievable, I would say, and a responsible NLP via a sustainable NLP is also achievable. So let's take a look at this first one. So how do we attain trust in NLP technologies? We need to trust in the purpose. So basically think about ethical considerations. So are we augmenting human abilities or are we substituting humans in, in, the, in the workforce? 
Is it automated or assisted decision making for sensitive domains? What about copyright, IP, and plagiarism? So can we trust the, the purpose? Trust in the process, building trustworthy development and evaluation frameworks. And trust in the outcome. Is the outcome safe, reliable, and robust? Is the outcome where it's needed to be explainable? Is it devise, are we devising practical accuracies that reflect user expectations? And transparency and dissemination process, so open science. I think that's also very critical. So these map very nicely onto the different tenets of RAFE. So trust in the purpose is a responsible innovation tenet. Trust in the process is a responsible systems and responsible research conduct tenet. And trust in the outcomes are responsible uh, systems and responsible research conduct tenet as well. So there are many commendable efforts in our community, uh, however. There are some loopholes that explain the loss of control in the current popular scaling paradigm, for example. So there's a lack of deep understanding of large models and data for training and evaluation. There's a lack of rigor in annotation processes and evaluation for, for evaluation, development, and training data. And basically, this leads to a lack of trust in the process. But also, there's a lack of practical accuracies, accuracy metrics that are commensurate with user and human perception or human uh, expectations. But there's also a lack of reliability and stability of performance. So you have unpredictability that happens in our systems. And there's a lack of transparency, explainability, interpretability, and openness, which leads to lack of trust in the outcome. So I'll delve a little bit into some of these aspects, uh, going a little bit deeper in terms of the science. So talking point number one, I am a strong believer in tooling, and I believe that large-scale tooling automation is critical for trust in the process. I'll show you just one example of that. So there are community-wide notable tooling, uh, toolings at scale, for example, model testing. So this is NLP checklist uh, that got the best paper award in 2020. It's inspired by principles of software engineering and behavioral testing to assess model behavior. And it has task agnostic testing. Uh, it's really a checklist of a matrix of general linguistic capabilities, such as part of speech tagging, negation, test types, uh, that facilitate comprehensive test ideation, but also provides a software tool to generate a large and diverse number of test cases quickly. There's also evaluation platforms. So there's something called Evaluate that's on, uh, <coughs> on Hugging Face and Evaluate on the Hub. So Evaluation on the Hub, sorry. So these are tools that you could use right away. <coughs> okay, my voice is letting, okay. But the primary fo focus here is around generalizability. Uh, there's also evaluation platforms that address robustness. So uh, Robustness Gym, which came out in NACL 2021, it's a tool that's also a common platform that easily develops and shares novel evaluation methods with built-in uh, set of abstractions. And beyond a single metric leaderboard, we have explainer board and dyna board. That's our, they're also technically extremely useful, and they're typically used for model interpretability. There are evaluation platforms out there. But what we did at Meta was a work that where we looked at trying to understand large data at data at scale, large data scales, um, with some level of characterization. Why is that useful? So this was work that we presented at AACL. So Text Characterization Toolkit is a dynamic lightweight platform and infrastructure that's supposed to enable easy def definition and configuration calculation of arbitrary quantitative metrics over very large corpora. So think about data at scale, like language, lo language level, language, large language model scale type data sets. Um, it comprises 61 metrics, with the majority as a re-implementation of the co-metrics metrics. Um, it provides dashboards to visualize and understand data. It has a standardized Jupyter notebook. It's already on GitHub, by the way. It discovers correlations between individual characteristics and outcomes. And it fits multivariable regression models to, product, to predict model performance based on text characterizations. So what is the motivation for how developing this toolkit, actually, was around NLP data sets are treated as homogeneous, typically relying on single summary metrics to understand model performance. And large data sets are known to have a lot of biases, artifacts, various correlations. And summary metrics tend to be very, um, uh, they fail to surface such aspects. And most available tools for analysis are not easy to use or scalable. So researchers rarely ever use um, you know, tools to actually get, gain insights into, into the data and breakdown uh, and use them in their paper and analyses. So the objective was to gain more understanding and control over large data by specifically targeting robustness. So can we characterize data sets of text which we expect our model to work significantly better or worse on? And can we actually control data selection? 
So as opposed to dumping just you know CC4 uh, 400 or CC100 into our data, into our um, language models, we can actually do selection and do this in a very smart way. Can we actually do this ahead of time? And we also wanted to look at biases. So can we figure out the kinds of biases that are in the data? So some of the categories of the implemented text metrics are around descriptive statistics, lexical diversity, complexity, incident scores, and word properties. And it relies on recent word property databases compared to the original Cometrics databases. Unfortunately, we only had it for English, but there is nothing you know, precluding us from actually sending it to other languages. So that was the intention all along. So basically, what does CCT have in action? So essentially, the current practice is that you build a model, you have the data, you do model predictions, you do evaluation metrics, and iterate on the model. That's typically the way things go. What we added there was actually taking the data, giving characteristics, iterating on the data, and then doing this feedback loop. And eventually, what we also ended up getting was figuring out influence measurements around, you know, can we correlate the, model, uh, the model's performance with the types of data, the role of the data that was in there, the characterizations of the data, and could it be, give us some insights into what kind of data is, is being used. So this is, we have a demo, we have a GitHub, as I said, a GitHub repository that has all our data and all our, sorry, all our tools on there, but essentially have different types of dashboarding to see, you know, to have different ways of visualizing your data characteriz characterizations at scale. So um, you're looking at, this was actually some of the graphs that we generated for the 6.7 billion parameter models that we produced within Meta. So uh, we also have heat maps, we have different types of graphs, so it's really nice, but we also have regression analysis and looking at coefficient fits and so on. So just to give you some idea of how this was used, so this is in a, in a use case for the multilingual language model that we built within Meta uh, around 2021, was a multilingual, what we called XGLM, which was 7.5 billion parameters. And we wanted to analyze the performance of the English section of the multilingual model, like the English performance on English tasks, compared to an English-only uh, language model. So this was comparing an implementation of GPT-3, um, which we replicated internally, and the off-the-shelf GPT-3 and the XGLM 7.5 billion parameter model. And essentially what we found, these, these tasks, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but these tasks are, tend to be uh, quite challenging from, um, from a linguistic perspective. So Story Close, Copa, Winne Grande, Hello Swag, Arc Easy, Arc Challenge, Pika, and Open Book QA are some of the very challenging um, tasks that we have in the field, revolving around natural language inference and entailment and so on. So we noticed that the monolingual GPT-3 did much better than the XGLM 6, 7 point, um, 7 5 billion parameters on the challenging English tasks. So we asked that question, it's like, why is this happening? Even though we have, I mean, we have significantly less data, obviously, for the English component of the, of the, of the XGLM, but still we expected it to do well, given that it's you know, a robust model. So we started looking at these numbers and we asked the question, um, is it affected by some kind of shift in the language distribution in the pre-training data. And lo and behold, using TCT, we were able to figure out that the TCT lexical diversity metric was able to see that, able to identify that the GPT-3 training data and test data distributions were kind of similar to each other compared to what we got from the XGLM components, the English components of the XGLM models. So here, there, the GPT-3 um, data distribution was closer to the test data than what we got from the XGLM. So that gave us some nice insights into this uh, data set at scale. Okay. So I want to move on to the next thing is rigor in annotation processes and for the evaluation, development, and training data. Um, maybe do you, any questions around what I just talked about here? I don't know. I don't know if you, uh, nothing, no? Okay. All right. All right. So we have a lot of very commendable um, initiatives at scale as well, so benchmarking at scale. So we have static large scale benchmark data sets like Big Bench, Glue, Super Glue, Gem, uh, Helm, Supernatural Instructions. These are very, very um, you know, large and they're actually quite uh, diverse. And there's also dynamic benchmarking, DynaBench, Rethinking Benchmarking, and NLP, which came out in 2021. So we have some very commendable efforts in the community, but they're still, you know, very individualistic, so to speak. 
So basically, I would like to talk about the second point here, which is around trusted annotation ecosystems. Can we trust the evaluation data? And I believe that this is also critical for the trust in the process. So annotated data, cre annotated data creation processes. So typically, we have data sources that go through some kind of random sampling that go to the development data. And we have some annotations that happen using guidelines that go to some annotators. And then we have annotated development data or training data or evaluation data. And then we basically split this data into like holdout, validation, and training. And then at time of actual deployment, we take real data, we do some random sampling, do some evaluation data for that using the same guidelines and do some annotations. And basically we end up getting evaluation data that's coming from the, the live streaming. So this is what happens in a typical actual production uh, framework. So it's more of an art than a science. There is very minimal QA quality assurance type of uh, processes that happen. I've observed this both in practice uh, in academia, but also in industry. So the quality control processes are quite lax, and this is a problem because you end up getting things that are not necessarily that, um, um, that robust, so to speak. So potentially that could have even the worst possible impact on interpretation of results and performance. So how can we devise reliable annotation ecosystems? So I'd say from the beginning, from a quality assurance perspective, we need to ensure appropriate evaluation data. So it needs to be, the proximity needs to be very close between the real data and the development data that you actually have created and garnered. So basically you need to make sure that your evaluation data set comprises almost all aspects of phenomena regardless of the training data distribution. So a lot of people end up getting a lot of the high frequency f signals but not the low frequency signals. And this is a problem, right? So you're losing track of the tail end of the spectrum. So, and believe it or not, that was something that I've observed in mach large machine translation systems across two major companies that I worked with, without naming names, uh, where a lot of the stuff that we had was around, thank you, happy birthday. And I'm like, this is our evaluation data, seriously, for like 100 and some languages uh, in the machine translation setting, for example. So we need to make sure that our data is actually reflective of the complexity of the phenomena that we deal with. But also, we need to also ensure the, that we have distributions that are you know, stratified as opposed to the random sampling that people typically do. So we should not be doing random sampling, we should be doing stratified sampling. That goes back to my original point about data selection. So if you have the tool to do data selection, you have data characterization, you'll be able to do the stratified sampling in a smart way to reflect the phenomena that you care about. But also, you need to have operationalized quality guidelines. So what does that actually mean? You need to have, so the guidelines, believe it or not, that I've seen across also industry and also in academia have been one pagers. And one pagers would tell you, annotate for this and maybe give you a couple of examples and a couple of positive examples, not necessarily the borderline examples. So this is a problem. So we need to have the guidelines that are actually talking about friction points. What do people need to do when they're annotating for data that is actually on the borders? On the, on the sort of like on the cusp of different phenomena that are confusing. What are the decisions they need to make? And be aware of that. And obviously that means a lot of iteration back and forth. So a TLDR of the task, annotation interfaces. So this is also an opportunity where we could maybe collaborate with colleagues in HCII, right? So people working on human computer interaction. How do we actually create annotation interfaces that are in fact um, commensurate with the latest technologies that we, where people could actually um, do some interesting work. Um, annotation schema with myriad examples, counter examples, especially for borderline cases, as I mentioned. And basic, yes? Right. So. It's always a trade-off, right? So you need to figure out which, so this is part of the, the, the interfacing of like how, which number of examples you show, you might have them in your database, but you need to pick maybe a couple of them that show different kind of parts of the spectrum. So it's, it is a, it's actually needs to be studied as a science of how do we go about exposing the annotators to the kind of examples that we care about. 
and without biasing them, because there is a subjective aspect of you as, a, as the experimenter, you know, it, overlaying your own biases yourself in how you choose the things, but also their own biases, their own subjective biases. So how do you make this as objective as possible? But there's also a notion that I'd like to talk about, which is something I'm not going to talk about here, is that we need to embrace that we actually bias exists whether we like it or not. So we're not trying to eliminate bias, we're trying to control for bias. And I think that's a very different framework. So, um, but that's a different talk, so uh, yeah. Um, so basically, the also heeding the cognitive load on people who are actually doing the annotations. Um, direct correspondence between annotation task description, annotation interface, well-designed annotation interface, and so on, and instruction with examples. And localization, so a lot of problems that we get to see also have to do with, say, especially when you're looking across different languages or across different modalities, you don't have a very good localization. And when I say localization, I mean making the, the experience be very relevant to the actual work that you're annotating. So for example, if you're annotating for Japanese or for, for, um, for hate speech in, in Arabic, you need to make sure that your examples are actually in this language, but also, in fact, the instructions are in this language. So um, I'm going to go over this, uh, also creating metrics for measuring annotation quality. So interannotator agreement, for example. Uh, we have um, looking at devising consistent automated annotation interfaces, as I said. Uh, data points should be randomly gold seeded and deduplication. So there's lots of aspects that go into this from a quality control perspective. I'm not going to go into that very much, but essentially the other aspect is proficiency of the annotators, making sure that they in fact are fit for the job. So this is another aspect. It's not just anybody who could speak English or could speak Arabic is a good annotator for hate speech. Or anybody who could do, you know, um, who knows this language could actually annotate for stereotypes. So you need to make sure that you have people who are well trained that know the task very well. Um, and looking at the provenance and pre-processing information preservation, so think about data cards, like ways of documenting, this goes into the accountability aspect of the work that we do. Um, yeah. Well, basically, you need to pick examples that are commensurate with all the phenomena that you have. And you pick them, maybe if you have enough data, then you pick equal sizes from the, each of the buckets, so to speak, because you've already binned your data into buckets that have similar characteristics. So this is one technique. But then you might end up getting a bucket that has very low number, amounts of data. So you need to upsample or some kind of do some downsampling on some other buckets and so on. So there is a whole slew of techniques that you need to employ to, get, to do the stratified sampling correctly. For all kinds of data, that, that, yeah, I'm just suggesting that we do this across the board. Okay. So it needs to be happening from the training, if possible, but also from the evaluation. But it's more critical for the evaluation, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the next portion of my talk is around lack of practical accuracy metrics that are commensurate with user human perception. And this goes to the lack of trust in the outcome. So I just wanted to give you, um, this was something that we actually worked on at, uh, at Meta, where we in fact rehauled the entire evaluation framework around machine translation. And it basically um, was essentially, we were thinking about this from the perspective of a faithful MT. So basically users of MT expect exact correspondence between source and target. And exact correspondence entails faithful rendering of target, achieving meaning, expression, usage equivalence, and the source while maintaining minimal distance. What is not is not a judgment of veridicality or, or the content or the provenance. So the desiderata that we had was to adopt faithfulness as an objective for a machine translation, which entails creating evaluation metrics that optimize for faithfulness, but also building faithfulness aware models and data sets. So this created sort of like a mindset, a mindset shift uh, in, in the way we looked at faithfulness, uh, sorry, uh, around machine translation. So we wanted to go beyond adequate meaning and fluency to, use, to also include usage considerations. And especially this was pertinent for social media data, you can imagine, things like you know, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on. And the potential of this uh, shifting of our mindset was basically allowing us to think of other approaches to evaluation. And it served us as a forcing function to build more interpretable models, so to speak. 
So we devised a new metric, which was called XSDS, which was inspired by the semantic textual similarity metric that already existed in the field. And it's essentially what, what we did there was basically the annotators were supposed to indicate the level of correspondence between two strings, directly between the source and the target. So no need for a reference translation. So you can imagine if we adopted that, that saved Meta huge amounts of money. And this SDS protocol is an established human uh, evaluation protocol that has been used extensively to measure semantic similarity across texts in the field. So the annotators answer the question is, how similar are two, two card strings to each other, not how good a translation is of another. So um, this became a new rubric, and the interrogator agreement was very, very high across me, uh, the, the some number of languages that we use. And in fact, that's the metric that's being used right now with no language left behind, if anybody heard, heard about this within Meta. This is the metric that's being used at this point. And it's being used actually across text and speech. So what is the XSCS rubric, some of the guidelines? Essentially, we try to capture hallucinations at one level. It's a very, um, we, actually the similarity is judged on a, on a five point scale. It goes from one all the way up to five. But the last two um, levels, basically four and five, reflect faithfulness in the evaluation. So how does it compare to direct assessment, which was kind of the protocol that was the de facto protocol? Um, it was fi within direct assessment, it has fine granularity of measurement, sensitive to both fluency and adequacy. It depends on human translation as a reference. And compared to XSTS, which has better rater agreement and reliability, no need for human reference translations, it's faster, less expensive, more objective, meaningful, and simpler. But it focuses on meaning rather than fluency. But potentially, we, we figured, so this is a trade-off. We figured that this is a trade-off that we could live with, given that neural machine translation, which is the current de facto technology that's being used, is in fact um, almost always very fluent. So fluency was never really a big ding for us. And it has better correspondence to human expectations in the process. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we did this for languages. So this is what you need there is basically the source and the target. But we need to recruit people who are bilingual, right? So this, this is basically the challenge. Do we find people from endangered languages who are you know, bilingual, who are fluent enough in English and the endangered language? Um, and this became a little bit of a challenge across some of the languages. But the majority of the languages had people who were bilingual in the first place. Because technically speaking, even when you're doing judgments on translation, English to English, so we get a reference translation. So, for, so it depends on the direction. If you're going source to target, source being English to target being a target language, you need somebody who speaks the target language and we have reference translations for the target language. So creating that in the first place, you need bilingual speakers, right? So that's kind of the pool we're tapping into. But basically, you don't need a reference translation. So typically, the way this happens is that you have a person producing a reference translation, and then we automatically judge you know, if the reference translation and the source, um, is the source and the target, sorry, are equivalent. Right. So this is our, our the evaluation process. You're saying you're only using the source. So source and target. So you have the string, say, English and Arabic. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the annotator is judging whether the English is a good correspondence to the Arabic, correspondent to the Arabic string. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit confused. Originally, there was, so there are targets, but also there was source and there's our the, 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 the predictions. Mm -hmm. but No, no, no. It's about so how people judge and evaluate the output of translations. Mm -hmm. I also know that. Uh -huh. What I mean is that in the S, 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 TS, uh -huh. is there are the two components? No, there are only two components. So source and target. target. Yeah. So no, reference. no reference translation. I see. So in, the, in the original. So the person has to judge whether the source and the target are good correspondence of each other. How similar are they? Is it a good translation of the of the of the source? So, so, so there's going to be so two languages. Like, so it's just like language. The, the source is bilingual, and the target is English. So there's going to be two languages. 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 So there's going to be two
Technology is right, so but it's about meaning. It's about meaning, right? Is it a good translation or not? You can judge if something is a good translation of another one. No, so this is for human evaluation, okay. right? So we, in a different in a different part of this, we have our multilingual machine translation systems. We have um, models that actually optimize for XSTS internally, and so on. That's a di that's a different part of the of the of the system. That's part of the XSTS model algorithmically. What I'm talking about here is the human evaluation rubric. Okay. So I think there is a bit of confusion. So there's a part of this that's part of the training where, you know, for example, you optimize for bleu, you optimize for, um, you know, direct assessment. In this case, we're optimizing for XSTS, but this is a different, this is a different part of the, the system. So in your training, you actually optimize for XSTS and there are other, there are ways of figuring out whether, you know, two strings are similar or not in the automatically, using algorithmically, right? But we can take this offline. I could tell you more about this afterwards, okay? Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this part because I was planning on going into the reliable and explainable outcomes of, um, of hate speech. So this is some work that we did also at Meta that basically what we did there was in fact trying to do what we did was do task decomposition for the purposes of hate speech detection and, um, and, uh, and classification. So, and this is specifically in the few shot situation. So I'll just um, tell you this is about bridging the NLP and the CL kind of sides of the, of the world. And the idea there was basically we looked at hate speech. So what is token as a system? We looked at hate speech detection in a few shot setting assuming low resource scenarios. And the work here leverages work by um, our own Martin Sapp and colleagues uh, around social biases inference corpus, where they took, so we specifically uh, strategically picked a few examples using stratified sampling based on text characterizations, including balancing out for different target groups. And we the, the core idea behind this work is around task decomposition. So instead of judging a string as being just hate speech or not, like a binary classification, we actually broke it down, broke the task down into subcomponents associating this with, with, with some linguistically motivated um, uh, uh, tenets. And we also did some knowledge infusion to ground a lot of the work that went into this, uh, into this project. So the task decomposition, basically, instead of saying whether something is hate speech or not, we asked whether it's offensive or not, whether there's a group that's being targeted, and what kind of group is that, what kind, what, what's the class of that group. And therefore, basically, based on this string of questions, are we able to say whether this is a hate speech or not? And um, uh, we looked at this, um, and we also did an extra step where we, in fact, infused the models with uh, some common sense knowledge and stereotype databases so that we had some grounding in, in outside uh, sort of like knowledge bases, so to speak. So just to give you an idea, if you just did the basic model, we were able to, if once you just break it down from a binary classification task to adding the subtasks as sort of like intermediate steps, we get a boost in performance without doing any knowledge infusion. Adding some knowledge also increased the performance. So that gave us a very good uh, signal that actually this was the right trajectory, the right direction that we go, need to go into. And um, just this, the, the columns here show you the number of shots, whether it's 16 shot all the way up to 512 shots in terms of the, um, the amount of data that was being used. And um, what we notice is uh, observing diminishing results at higher number of shots, which is kind of expected. What, what was also very interesting as a surprise to us was the generalizability. So we noticed that our system token outperformed baselines, especially on OOD data sets. So we trained for social biases, um, SBIC, and we tested on Ethos, Hate Explain, and HS18, and we noticed across the board that Token did better than all of these, uh, all the other models um, combined. And there was a robustness, so there's stability and reliability. So if you looked at the performance across the different samples, so uh, the, the, uh, if we, we report all our results over 10 runs, which is typical in this field, um, we noticed that the standard deviations were very, very tight 
when it comes to token compared to, um, uh, to other baseline models, like if you just use BART out of the box. So doing task decomposition was very useful. Actually adding also the knowledge infusion was also very useful. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but I'm going to go straight into sustainability. And I just want to give you some highlights here. So why is sustainability of NLP critical? The question that typically gets asked is NLP saturated. Do we need to grow in terms of solutions, systems, users, researchers, and developers? And I believe that DNI, diversity and inclusion, are cornerstones of this NLP growth. In order to ensure the longevity of the field, we need to also heed the impact on the, on, on the environment, but also need to collaborate with other disciplines as, as, as expected and help shape the policies and regulations and allow our voice to be heard in, in for example, in the policy making uh, hallways. So what are aspects of sustainable NLP? It needs to be accessible. So it needs to reach more people in various communities in all languages, lowering the entry user barrier costs to get into the field. It has to be relevant, it has to be also improving people's lives, so it has to be useful. It has to be maintainable, it has to be benevolent. So these are typical, these are aspects of the RAFE diversity and inclusion component, the responsible innovation component, and the reliable uh, and responsible research, uh, responsible systems component, and the responsible research conduct components. So how can we operationalize this for sustainable NLP? So why DNI could, should be a cornerstone of sustainable NLP? Morally, given the utility of the technology, I believe that it's incumbent upon us to ensure that their people have access and adoption by people giving them the freedom to reject it if they need to. Otherwise, it's a form of disenfranchisement. And scientifically, DNI serves as a forcing function to think of low resource scenarios, where low resource refers to not just language presence digitally or for a number of speakers, but also culture, domain, topic, resource availability. And opportunistically and synergistically, strategically growing our communities by using our technology to make the science more accessible. So how DNI? We need to have more access. We need to ensure our teams are as diverse as possible. But I think that's not sufficient because you cannot only hire so many people. So we need to do a lot of more outreach to be able to, to achieve that goal. But also we need to increase our NLP pool in general. So what if NLP is not diverse and inclusive? What's the, what's the bad side of this? It basically amplifies the global digital divide, so and languages, politics, a vehicle for cultural and communication. It deprives the field of the rich diversity in cognitive skills, creativity, curtailing the field's potentiality. But also, we would have failed at, some, at the mission for catering to all peoples of the world, and this is part of the mission of NLP in general. So this is part of our target as, as a, p a community working on this field. And I believe that this, this analogy is very apt here. Like if medicine science that only caters to and studies and keeps track of white, Western, European, American males, ignoring other races and genders, this would be the case if we don't do diversity and inclusion very proactively. So what's the North Star? We have an NLP practitioners and researchers carrying out NLP in their local languages. And how do we start? We should start from the top of the funnel. Every STEM program worldwide has an NLP component in its local language. So that's the dream, obviously. That's not the case that we have today. So what DNI? DNI in our research portfolio, different approaches. We are a young field, so we can afford to take risks. DNI are scientific perspectives, informed by other disciplines. And DNI are model systems, and DNI are our teams. DNI in our science knowledge dissemination. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, just really highlighting this real quick. So we did this work on XGLM, which is this large language model that was multilingual. And it basically was four large language models at various scales. We took 30 languages from 16 language families. We were very deliberate around how we picked the languages, how we picked them, the representations, the samples that we had in them. So this goes to the question about stratified sampling. And uh, we looked at the performance of the XLM, XGLM model, comparing it to Anglo-centric models in a zero and few shot settings. So what we found was that in unsupervised machine translation, um, we did really quite well. In fact, it outperformed GPT-3 with a few exceptions on high resource languages and larger model versions. But it was also competitive with SODA, state of the art supervised machine translation baselines, even outperforming them in 45 of the languages that are included in the Flores data set, which is 182 languages. So that was kind of a nice performance gain. And the benefits in, in general are around energy and maintenance efficiencies, but also they present a model the, this type of models, I'm very a big fan of these types of models because they present a paradigm shift from the Anglo-centric view of the world. 
And paying attention to the design of these models is actually a research question that's very you know, critical, that it's not necessarily that straightforward. It's not just about balancing things out. You need to pay a lot of attention to the underlying phenomena when you're trying to do this data sampling and data, data stratification. And essentially what we've noticed was that, especially for the medium to low resource languages, we were able to enable technologies that were built for economically challenged languages. And having such, mo such models catering to scarcer languages spurs scientific research in those languages, leading to more diversified NLP. So that's, it serves so many benefits. Um, I'm going to skip over this part, uh, which is around uh, choosing um, DNI. I just want to highlight the last part of my talk, which is around DNI, the 6060 initiative, which I started in 2022 which is around the translation of our sciences. So what is it? It's this challenge was ACL turned 60 in uh, 2022, uh, and the first ACL took place in 2023. So what we tried to do is enable multilingual scientific communication in 60 languages across all modalities. So think about text, speech, sign language. And we wanted to increase accessibility during and post conferences. So what the core theme was globalization via localization. And in fact, it was supposed to be a year long, now we extended it to two years because we haven't finished a lot of the work that we intended to start working on. So why 6060? It's about democratization of CL and NLP science, removing ingrained language bias in the scientific landscape, but also providing a voice to unlock the people's creativity and innovation without a language barrier, and creating scientific language and terminology in many more languages. And of course, we believe that our technology is mature enough to achieve this goal for the time being. So, and we're not giving up on English, because that comes up a lot. We're not giving up on English as a central language for scientific dissemination, but basically enabling other people, to, uh, other people of other languages to speak their, uh, and use their language. So how did we do this? We did a seed initiative that was, um, took place in March 2022. There are six work streams that are still active. Speech translation, text translation, scientific ter terminology curation, wikification, sign language interpretation, and slide presentation translation, and website creation. And basically, this is a global collaboration across academia, big tech, medium tech, nonprofit startups. And basically, the, by the end of the challenge, you want to have a comprehensive translation for the entire ACL anthology into 60 languages. You wanted to have comprehensive standardized scientific and CL terminology lists with contextual examples in 60 languages. Capability to have live cross-lingual CC and dubbing in 60 languages. Comprehensive repo for all the talks and videos from the CL community but also we will have spurred research into sign language going beyond what we did in 2022 and start thinking beyond translation for democratization. So think about demystification of CLAI. So what's the call to action? That's the reason I wanted to highlight this is that we'd like to leverage our internal scientific community for crowdsourcing translations for all modalities. So please volunteer if you have time. Uh, we could turn this into theses, we could turn this into interesting work. But we also have many tasks that need all hands as leaders as well as volunteers. And there are lots of shared tasks. Actually, there was one that was very successful this year that was funded by the 6060 Initiative through the ACL community. Um, and these were some of the people who actually uh, were part of that. So uh, in conclusion, I'd like to emphasize that the future of NLP needs to be trusted and sustainable. Both are attainable through responsible NLP. I also would like to hope, I hope I made the case for controlled NLP to attain the trusted NLP. And it emerges from responsible NLP, but also if we think of responsibility, we could in fact lead, it could lead us to sustainability and efficiency via DNI. And also I propose a responsible AI framework for NLP and hopefully provided some direction for operationalization. So this is not just talk in, in, in the sort of theoretically, it's actually something that we can do practically in our work. Um, and I hope you've been inspired to think about the future of NLP. So what's the future outlook? I propose framing NLP as a responsible NLP, as a broad interdisciplinary enterprise with multilinguality and cross-cultural considerations at the core. And the practicalities of this means that we need to invest and incentivize scalable tooling and processes, make checklists to make it easier for practitioners to adopt RAFE, uh, consider low resource language research as first class citizens in our NLP enterprise, but also establish annotation science leveraging multiple disciplines and build genuine bridges of collaboration and adjust our NLP curricula to address responsible AI, uh, responsible AI um, frameworks, especially around graduating people from our programs. So this was actually my hope for this department is that we in fact start thinking about Da Vinci's as opposed to just people in silos. 
and encourage and support more conferences and outreach programs, especially in the global south. So what are the take home messages? Mainstream NLP, uh, responsible NLP in academia, civic society and industry. Treat NLP with the rigor of critical systems. Adopt a collaborative mindset of DNI, making it core to our enterprise, but proactively thinking of responsible NLP from inception to dissemination. And responsible NLP should be a mod modus operandi for all of us, not just subset or a track. Uh, so it becomes the new practitioner's mindset. And uh, we don't have to be perfect, but we need to engage and practice right, uh, proactively. And from and use actually responsible NLP from a user-centric perspective is the magic bullet. So think that we will bring back the science into NLP, explainability, interpretability, ensuring higher scientific integrity, but also simultaneously building trust uh, with the users, achieving the goals of NLP utility for humans. And this leads to a sustainable NLP via efficiency and DNI increasing accessibility. And that's it. Thank you so much. Any quick questions? Otherwise, I can get to questions. So you talked about uh, NLP as a kind of engineering discipline in social media. And I think what that kind of encourages is an implicit bias towards building things, necessarily. Mm -hmm. How we, we should not be building things, you said? Yeah, how do you conceptualize like, the role of saying no to So depending on, so for example, I can take an analogy from computer vision, where um, there are people who work on you know, systems that do um, you know, face recognition and so on, which are potentially you know, harmful to society. So do we stop them from building the technology, or do we uh, you know, regulate how it's being deployed? I'm of the second camp of regulating how it's being deployed, but we should not stop people from developing the technology, especially if it has a lot of other benefits, right? So we need to weigh very carefully what the benefits are to the risks and essentially figure out. And I feel, I feel like every type of technology would have to go through this. So um, from that perspective, it's something that needs to be regulated from always from the outside, but also by the builders of the technology themselves. So I don't know if that addresses the question. Um, I, I would love to take it off. Sure, sure. I think we'll, given the time, I think we'll, we'll thank Luna once again and then remind everybody to come and hang out and spend two hours discussing how we should set up regulation of NLP technology. No, just, <laughs> just, to, just, to, just to chat. So, thank you, Mona. Thank you so much.